Well, um, in hopes of inspiring more people to do the second programming project, I'm going to start off tonight by uh, finishing up two topics on random walks, one of which I just mentioned last time and the other which I didn't get to at all. And <clears throat> these are illustrated in the output of the program that I wrote that tallies up statistics for 1,500 random walks. Uh, the two issues are the first visit to the maximum and the so-called sojourn times, or the amount of time spent above the axis. And uh, if you look at first max here, I mentioned last time, this has more or less the same distribution as the other statistics, except that there's an awful lot here and not quite so many here. And I want to explain exactly why that's so. And then I also want to explain to you uh, in general terms why the distribution of the amount of time spent above the axis is pretty much the same as the distribution as of the last visit to the origin or the first visit to the final step. There is, I continue to maintain, no intuitive way of seeing that all these things should have the same distribution, but they do. So let's go back and revisit topic 15 from the last outline. First visit to max. And uh, I want to remind you of all the things that are equal for one of these symmetric random walks, where the probability of a step up and the probability of a step down are both equal to 1 half. We've got this quantity u sub 2n, which can be calculated as 2n choose n times 1 over 2 to the 2n. And this is equal to pretty much everything you can think of. It is, as you will recall, equal to the probability of returning to 0 after 2n steps. It's also equal to the probability that the walk never returns to 0 in 2n steps. And it's equal to the probability that the walk is non-negative in 2n steps. But it's equal to a couple of other things that I'm going to slip in here and here. If a random walk in an even number of steps never returns to 0, what minimum level difference from 0 must it have after those steps? <coughs> 2, right? Because it has to be in an even level. So it can be in minus 2 or plus 2, but it can't be in minus 1 or plus 1. And therefore, it's got to stay away from 0 for the next step also. <coughs> so this is also equal to the probability that the random walk is non-zero in 2n plus 1 steps. <coughs> so this same quantity, u sub 2n, works for both of these things. In the non-negative case, things are a little bit trickier. If a walk is non-negative for 2n steps, is it guaranteed to be non-negative for 2n plus 1 steps? No, no, because it could be in 0, and it could go negative now. However, the one thing we can be sure of is that it was non-negative for the first 2n minus 1 steps. Because if it ends up non-negative, it can't have come up to 0 from minus 1. So, this is also equal to the probability that the walk is non-negative in 2n minus 1 Can steps. you say that for non-zero, too? No, I can't say it for non-zero. Because for non-zero, if it's non-zero after 2n steps, it has to stay that way. Um, 
And there are some walks that are non-zero for 2n minus 1 steps that go zero on the 2nth step. There are, however, no walks that are non-negative for 2n minus 1 steps that go negative on step 2n. Does everyone see that? If after 2n minus 1 steps you haven't gone negative, you're not going to go zero on the 2nth step. However, if you have stayed positive for 2n minus 1 steps, you could go to 0 on step 2n and spoil everything. So there's a fundamental asymmetry here, which is what uh, makes the analysis of this next situation work. So we really have three cases for the maximum. And I'm going to work out the general formula. And then maybe I don't have enough faith in myself. But after I had done this, I actually looked at all 16 cases for 2n equals 4 and counted them to make sure the formulas were correct. Uh, and I'll do the same thing here. So the first case is the maximum occurs at level j. And j is 0. In other words, we may get back to 0, but we never go into positive territory. What's the probability of that in 2n steps? 2n steps, we never do back. I mean, you walk into the casino. Um, you may have to borrow some money as you go, because you walk in flat broke, and you're never in the black the whole evening. So that means you had a non-positive night at the casino. And in your 2n bets, we've got u to the 2n, with no one half in front of it. OK, second case. j is equal to 2k, where k is positive, can't be 0. So j is a positive, even integer. OK, what's going to happen now? We'll get up to the maximum at some level. Doesn't matter what the level is. And we get there at step 2k. We may go back there from time to time, but we never go above that level again. So this is a diagram representing how we can uh, achieve the maximum for the first time at an even step 2k. OK, from 2k up to 2n, we have a random walk that's non-positive. What's the probability of that? Uh, U, U sub. Isn't it the same? Is it symmetrical around? Yeah, non-positive and non-negative are the same. So uh, for not going above the maximum, we have a U, to the two, U sub 2n minus 2k. On this other side, we don't touch this level. Otherwise, the first maximum would have been achieved earlier. Uh, so this is more restrictive than just non-zero. It's on one side. It's like having an all-positive walk or an all-negative walk. And the probability of that is one half times u sub 2k, where the 1 half is for the fact that we're always staying on one side of it, whereas this says non-zero, meaning either always stays positive or always stays negative. Finally, and this is the tricky one, j is equal to 2k plus 1, where k is greater than or equal to 0. So this includes the case j equals 1. OK, we've got the same sort of situation. We have to have a walk that stays on the bottom side of this line 
for the first 2k plus 1 steps. But by what I've already said, which u gives us that? The probability of having a non-zero walk for 2n plus 1 steps is the same as the probability of having a non-zero walk for 2n steps. So uh, that means we've got 1 half u sub 2k. Again, one step longer, but it doesn't matter. And now we've got 2n minus 2k minus 1 steps left. But we're looking for a non-positive walk in that time. And by what I pointed out here, the probability of having a non-positive or non-negative walk for some odd number of steps is the same as the probability for having such a walk if you bump up the odd number to the next even number. Which means that whether you're thinking of an even integer or the odd integer just, just above it, the formula is the same, except that 0 is an exception, because this has the 1 half. OK, uh, that's the whole story. And now I'm going to do a check for the case where 2n equals 4. What I'm going to do is draw all 16 possibilities. and uh, you tell me after what step the maximum is achieved. Maximum is achieved after step four. four. Achieved after step three. three. Achieved for the first time at step after step two. Again after step two. Step four. four. Step one. one. Step one. Step one. Yep, that agrees with my notes so far. OK, now I'm going to flip these all over. Step. Zero. Step. Step. Zero. Zero. Step zero. Step zero. Lots and lots of zeros. Step zero. Step zero. That's good. We wanted six of them. That's step three. three. And this one is step uh, four. Four. OK. Now, u sub 2 is equal to 2 choose 1 times 1 over 2 squared, which is 1 half u4 is equal to 4 choose 2 over 2 to the fourth, which is 3 eighths. So u2, u2, which shows up in a couple of places, is equal to 1 fourth. Now let's check. Maximum at 0 is supposed to be achieved with probability u sub 2n u sub 4 is 3 eighths. That's 6 out of 16. And there they are. So that worked. Let's choose j equals 2. For j equals 2, we should get 1 half times 1 half times 1 half, or 1 eighth. What's the probability of getting the maximum at 2? 2 out of 16. So that worked. At 4, 1 half times u sub 4 is 3 sixteenths. And there's 1, there's 2, there's 3. 
So that worked. Notice the probability of achieving the maximum after an even number of steps is greater than that of achieving the maximum after an odd number of steps. But we do have 1 and 3. For 1, we have 1 half times u4, which is 3 over 16, according to the formula. There they are, 1, 2, 3. And finally, for 3, we have 1 half times u2 times u2, which is uh, 1 eighth and 1, 2. There they are. So uh, I finally got this right. The only place I've seen this explained in print is in the solution book to the uh, other probability text that Sturzacher co-authored. And there, the explanation is so shortened that uh, I and two classes of Harvard undergraduates, I think, have never succeeded in getting all the details correct. But I think this time, I finally understand it. And I hope that you do, too. And uh, what you might want to do if you code this up is don't merely break things up into deciles, as I did, but you might want to split off 0 as a special case and see whether it does show up roughly twice as frequently as anything nearby. Of course, you won't get exact results by counting any number of random walks. You only get exact results in this game from theoretical analysis. And then you can do experiments with random number generators and see whether the numbers you get are close to your predictions. And if they are, you say, well, I, haven't probably, I probably haven't done something too terribly wrong. Questions about this one? Yeah, Jerry? I'm still not clear on where that 1 half factor comes from. The 1 half factor comes because on this side, we're not allowed to touch this level. That's like starting off at level 0 and never going to a negative level, never going to 0, right? This is equivalent to that situation. That's not merely a non-zero walk. That's a positive walk. u sub 2n is the probability that you get either something like that oh, okay. or something like that. If I used u sub 2k here, it would include that probability, which is inconsistent with this being the maximum value. OK? Now let me say a little bit about the analysis of the so-called sojourn times. This is a messy inductive proof. It's not really done very satisfactorily in our textbook. But I've included it for the sake of completeness, simply because it has the same answer as all the other questions. If the answer to this question were different, I would never have mentioned it. But I think it's so fascinating when many apparently different questions have exactly the same answer, that it's worth knowing all about them. So uh, an example of this that I once wrote, I believe, is a multiple choice item for my undergraduate course is the following. Uh, you have a nomadic family, and they live near the border between Iraq and Syria in somewhat more peaceful times, if that could have happened. And every month, they pick up their tent. They flip a coin. If a coin comes up heads, they move their tent a kilometer east. If it comes up tails, they move a kilometer west. So they started out on the border. And they walk back and forth, sometimes in Syria, sometimes in Iraq. And they do this for, let's say, 24 months. And then the word comes out, anyone who spent 18 or more of the last 24 months inside Iraq gets to vote in the parliamentary election, but someone who spent less than 18 months doesn't, what's the probability that this family will be allowed to vote? So the question is, 
what fraction of the time will be spent on the Iraqi side of the border, what fraction on the Syrian side of the border. Or to go back to our more standard example of Harvard and Yale playing lots and lots and lots of football games, you look at the newspaper every morning and either Harvard is ahead in the standings or Yale is ahead in the standings. What's the probability that Harvard is ahead more than three quarters of the time? And the fascinating result is the answer is the same as for all these other questions. The obvious answer, which is you'd expect Harvard to be in the lead roughly half the time and Yale to be ahead roughly half the time, is wrong as can be. That's the least likely outcome. And the most likely outcome is that one team goes ahead and never falls behind again, or the other team goes ahead and never falls behind again. So this naive intuition that things are always 50-50 based on the binomial distribution and other such things is, again, wrong as can be. Now, let me explain how this gets analyzed. Uh, I will let beta sub 2n of 2k equal the probability that there are 2k steps in positive territory in Iraq or Harvard is ahead in the standings during a walk of two and steps. And what I'm going to do is write down a formula that has to be satisfied by this quantity on the basis of conditional probability, plug in the answer and show it works. And you might say that's not a proof, but it is, in fact, a valid proof by induction. I don't want to belabor the point because it's still a little bit hairy. But let me show you how it works. So what's going to happen? This family roams around, and sooner or later, after two R steps, they get back to the border for the first time. Or, alternate scenario, Harvard and Yale play a few games, and after two R games, they're tied for the first time. These two R steps contribute either all toward positive territory or none toward positive territory. And then things go on. ending up at 2n. That's one way this could continue. Here's another way it could conti continue. I don't have anything to say about whether or not it revisits 0 again, simply that it visits 0 for the first time at 2r. So f 2r is the probability that the first return to 0 is after 2R steps. OK. Now, here's the really clever way of analyzing this. And this, I hope, will reinforce my general message that the right way to analyze a lot of tough problems is to use conditional probability. Consider two different things that can happen and see whether by breaking down your analysis in, term, analysis in terms of those two alternatives, you can reduce a complicated problem to a simpler problem. And here we can do this. Let's consider this is case one, and this is case two. So we'll do case one first. Given that the first return to 0 is after 2R steps, what's the probability that all the time was spent on the Iraqi rather than the Syrian side of the border? 1 half. So I need a 1 half. And then I've got this quantity F sub 2R. I don't have a, well, I actually gave you two formulas for that last time, but we don't need any of those in order to solve the problem. OK, so now this family has already spent two R months in Iraq. They have two N minus two R months left to go. 
And in order to get a total of 2K months spent inside Iraqi territory, how many months do they need to spend in the rest of the time? 2K minus 2R. 2K minus 2R. That's simple enough, isn't it? OK. Second case. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to leave myself some room here, because uh, that's not quite the whole story. They spent all their time in Syria. The probability that they first get back to the border after 2R months, having spent all their time in Syria so far, is 1 half F sub 2R. They've got 2n minus 2r months left. And in order to get a total of 2k months in Iraqi territory, how many of those months have to be spent in Iraq? 2K. All 2k. Now, uh, I also have to sum over all the different possible values of R. And the limits of summation are a little bit tricky here. Here, R only goes from 1 to K, because if uh, R is equal to K, they've already got their required residency time for 2K, and they have to spend all the rest of the time in Syria. And here it goes from 1 to N minus K. OK, we're almost done. The answer is beta 2n of 2k is, of course, u sub 2k times u sub 2n minus 2k. That is, the answer is given by exactly the same formula that has worked for every other problem of this sort that we solved. And the way I can verify this answer in this case is to plug it into the formula, by which I mean, strictly speaking, I'm going to assume that this is true for walks of fewer than 2n steps, plug it in, and if I can show that it's also true for walks of 2n steps, then I've established it by induction for all values of n. So let's do that. We've got the sum of 1 half times f sub 2r times, so I'm going to assume the result is valid. So I have u sub 2k minus 2r from there, and u sub 2n minus 2k from there. And then in the other case, I have f sub 2r. And if my formula is correct, I have u sub 2k times u sub 2n minus 2r minus 2k. So I've just taken this putative answer and used it in these two special cases. Now let's think about this. This is a constant. Oh, it's getting difficult to read that marker. Oh, OK. Since this is the last line, I'll change colors. Finish up in glowing green. Wow. Even King George could see that one. U sub 2n minus 2k. Now what have I got? The sum over all values of r of the probability that I get back to the origin for the first time at 2r and then stay at the origin up to step 2k. Or more simply put, the probability that I'm back at the origin after 2k steps. Right? This sum is just breaking down this u sub 2k according to when I first come back to the origin. But I sum up over all values of r, and that drops out. So that's easy enough. What about the second one? Well, u sub 2k doesn't involve r. 
Now I'm saying, what's the probability that I will first come back to the origin at 2r and then still be in the origin by virtue of having stayed there over the next 2n minus 2k minus 2r steps. That's the probability of being back at the origin after 2n minus 2k steps. So these two things are equal. And when I add them, I get this. And that's actually the whole proof. I said in the notes it was awfully messy, so I wasn't going to talk about it. But that's the whole story. It does indeed fit on the board. Um, I am not, not, not going to hold you responsible for the details of doing these proofs. I would like you to know the answers because the, example, the answers are so remarkable, I'd like them to be spread more widely around the world. And so the basic facts about all the things that are equal to u sub 2n, I'd like you to know. And all the things that are equal to u sub 2k times u sub 2n minus 2k, I'd like you to know. Uh, I'd also like you to know the fundamental style of argument in terms of matching up paths to show that things are the same when we count them. And it might be nice to be able, as I believe you've already done on the homework, to be able to match up the paths of one type with the paths of another type to show that you know how to do it. But I will not ask you to put together one of these messy proofs from scratch. We have better things to do in our limited final exam. And that finishes up random walks. So we can go to a completely new topic now. And let me tell you the, prob the problem that got me interested in this. I was browsing through the problem volume for uh, Sturzacher's other book and saw the problem. What's the probability of throwing a total of 26 on 10 dice? I thought, that's insane. You could never answer that problem without a computer. It would take forever to figure out all the different ways that 10 dice could total to 26 and count them. <coughs> and then I looked in the back of the book, and there was an answer given in terms of three binomial coefficients. And I thought, hmm, how on earth did they get that? And once I figured it out, I decided, well, I'll have to teach a little bit about generating functions, because any technique that will let you solve uh, such an apparently messy problem straightforwardly is worth knowing a little bit about. And we're going to do just a little bit about generating functions because most of the best tricks involve calculus. And I know that many of you actually know calculus, but I'm continuing to abide by my prerequisites and pretend that you don't. First, I need to do a little bit of preliminary stuff. We're now on outline 10 because all of this depends on the concept of independent random variables. And I haven't really defined what it meant for two random variables to be independent. We all know what independent events are. Events A and B are independent if the probability of A intersect B is equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. And for independent random variables, the events in question are simply the ones that show up in the mass function. That is, event A is the event where random variable capital X achieves the value little x. And event B is random variable capital Y achieves the value little y. And so if I take that formula and substitute in these events, I say the probability that x equals x and y equals little y. And I could perfectly well put an intersection sign between these. But it's sort of conventional just to use a comma 
in this place. So this comma is an alternate notation for intersection. But this means that capital X equals little x, capital Y equals little y. And the random variables are independent. If that's equal to the product of these two probabilities for all values of x and y. Now, something nice that happens in this case is that the expectation of the product of x and y is equal to the expectation of x times the expectation of y. That's not always the case. It's not so in general. It is going to turn out, I'll give you a wonderful counterexample in a minute. It's going to turn out that independence of the two random variables is a sufficient condition for this, but not a necessary condition. That is, if the two variables are independent, this holds. If this holds, the two variables may or may not be independent. How am I going to prove this? Well, I can write this down. And hope nobody stops me. But what you should say is, hey, Paul, that's not really the definition of the expectation of the random variable x, y, is it? And I say, well, no, as a matter of fact, you've caught me. You're right. The definition of the expectation of the random variable x, y is I should take all values that can be achieved by the product of x, y, find all combinations of little x and little y that achieve them, and sum up like that. But we have already done this sort of argument once before in proving the law of the unconscious statistician. And if you go through the tedium of writing this out just right, you'll discover that this obvious formula is indeed correct. Uh, strictly speaking, it's a slight generalization of the law of the unconscious statistician. And it's far and away the easiest way of computing the expectation of some function of two random variables. OK. Now, if the variables are independent, then this is xy times the probability that random variable x equals little x times the probability that y equals little y. And this is summed over all pairs, x and y, that can be achieved by these two random variables. But now this thing factors, right? Uh, having said I'm pretending that nobody knows calculus, I will say many of you are familiar with the fact that if you're doing a double integral and the function you're integrating is the product of a function of x and a function of y, you can write the integral as the product of two integrals. The same thing works for sums. So I can write this as the sum of x times the probability that random variable x equals little x, summed over all values of little x that can be achieved, times y times the probability that random variable capital Y equals little y summed over y, basically because if I expand this, expand this, and enumerate all the terms, here's a list of all the terms that I get. But what's this equal to? This is the expectation of x, right? And this one's the expectation of y. So as long as I have independence, which let me factor this into the product of those two terms, the expectation of the product is equal to the product of the expectations. Remember, the sum of the expectations is equal to the expectation of the sum for any two random variables, no matter what. But when products are involved, you have to be careful. In general, you need independence. Uh, but more precisely, what you need is two random variables that are called uncorrelated. So sort of just for the record, 
let me define uncorrelated variables. Well, I've lost the clip, but I'll put it, is that still working? Okay. So, now we'll go on to topic number two, which is uncorrelated. variables. And these are defined by the formula I just proved. Random variables x and y are said to be uncorrelated if the expectation of their product is equal to the product of their expectations. Independent implies uncorrelated. As you'll see in my next topic, Uncorrelated does not necessarily imply independent, but it's uncorrelated that I need to assume in order to be able to prove a result that will bail us out next week. Namely, although in general for two random variables, the variance of x plus y is not equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y. This is true if x and y are uncorrelated. First, let me convince you that this is not true in general. And to show you that it's not true in general, I will let y be the same random variable as x, so that x plus y is 2x. So let's calculate the variance of 2x. The variance of 2x is equal to the expectation of 2x squared minus the square of the expectation of 2x. If I square 2x, I get 4x squared. And the expectation of 4x squared is clearly 4 times the expectation of x squared. The expectation of 2x is twice the expectation of x. When I square it, I get 4 times the square of the expectation of x. And when I put these together, I get 4 times the variance of x. Variance is a measure of the expected value of the square of the difference from the mean, of the difference from the expectation. So it's not surprising if you double everything, the variance will go up by a factor of 4. So this is an extreme case where uh, the variance of x plus y is twice the sum of the two variances. But now I'm going to show you if the variables are independent. x is certainly not independent of itself. So that was really quite an extreme case. I'm going to assume independence now. Independence. And I'm going to calculate the variance of x plus y, which is, of course, the expectation of the quantity x plus y squared minus the square of the expectation of x plus y. OK, let's write this out x plus y squared is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. And the expectation of the sum of any finite number of terms is equal to the sum of their expectation. So when I write out the first term, 
I get the expectation of x squared plus twice the expectation of xy plus the expectation of y squared. From the second term, the expectation of x plus y is the expectation of x plus the expectation of y. And when I square that, I get the square of the expectation of x. I get twice the expectation of x times the expectation of y. And I get the expectation of y quantity squared. Now let's see what we've got. Combine that with that. That's the variance of x. So far, so good. Combine that with that. And I have the variance of y. That's what I would like, but I still got some more terms around, namely this one and this one. So I add on to that plus twice the quantity expectation of xy minus expectation of x times expectation of y. And this is 0 if the two variables are, it's certainly 0 if they're independent, but more generally, it's 0 if they're uncorrelated. So if two variables are independent, and occasionally, if they're not independent, but satisfy this somewhat weaker condition of being uncorrelated, it's true that the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. Since there are lots of situations where you add together lots and lots of independent random variables, that's what you do when you add up the rolls on a certain number of dice. It's what's going on all the time in a random walk if you count uh, plus 1 for a plus step and minus 1 for a minus step. So uh, knowing the variance of the sum of two or more independent random variables is very useful. And here's a very simple formula for it. OK, I think I've got time for my counterexample. Have I got? Oh, 10 minutes. Wow. OK, so. Uh, this counterexample is drawn from the world of standardized testing. And here's what we're going to do. We are going to administer to every kid in the Commonwealth a two-question test. Two true-false questions. And since they're true-false to compensate for guessing, we'll say they count plus one if you get them right and minus one if you get them wrong. And some people are interested in how well the kids do, but other people are much more interested in whether Johnny is improving or not. So in number three, a counterexample. We'll have a sample space of test outcomes. Now, basically, when you take this test, there are only four things that can happen. Either you get both questions right, or you get the first one right and the second one wrong, or the first one wrong and the second one right or really blow it and get both wrong. So those are the four possible outcomes. And now what we're going to do is to define two random variables, namely x, the score on the test, and y, the improvement as you go through the test. Why anyone should care whether a student improves on going through the test, I don't know. But it makes a nice example anyway. Okay. So if you get both questions right, what's your score? Two. two. We're correcting for guessing. If you get one right, one wrong, your score is? Zero. Zero. If you get them both wrong, you get a big minus two. Okay. You get the first one right and the second one right, what's your improvement score? Zero. Got them both wrong, your improvement score is zero. But if you got the 
first one wrong and the second one right, you improved by two points as you went to the second question. Whereas if you've got the first one right and the second one wrong, you went down by minus two. I suppose, in fact, if you had a one multiple a one question multiple choice test in 2005 and then another one question test in 2006, there would actually be people paying a lot of attention to this statistic. But my point is, here is a simple experiment, and here are two perfectly reasonable random variables. These are functions from the sample space to the real numbers, in particular to the real numbers 0, 2, and minus 2. And the curious thing about these variables is that they are uncorrelated, but they're not independent. Let's first see why they're uncorrelated. If a student guesses at random, so each of these has a probability of 1 fourth, what's the expected value of x? Zero. Zero. Okay. That's the whole point of trying to correct for random guessing, so that someone who randomly guesses on one of these tests will get a score of zero. Good statistics, but bad politics, in my opinion. And what's the expected improvement? Zero. zero. Someone's as likely to get worse going to the second question as to get better. OK, let's work out the product xy. The product of xy is always zero. So the expectation of xy is 0. Therefore, the expectation of xy equals the expectation of x times the expectation of y. And these are uncorrelated. And for that matter, the variance of x plus the variance of y does equal the variance of x plus y. But these two random variables are not independent. Now, the best way to think about independence is to use the conditional probability reformulation of it. So um, Johnny comes home and says, Ma, I got my test scores back. Okay, now you know that Johnny does these tests by flipping coins. And so you say, aha, the probability for each of these four outcomes is 1 fourth. And Johnny says, yeah, and I didn't get any better or worse since last year. And that means that Johnny must either have got both questions right or both questions wrong. So these are not independent random variables because knowing something about one of them forces you to change your conditional probability estimates for the other one. If you want to be a little more formal about this, you can say, What's the probability that the random variable capital X is equal to 0? One, one half. What's the probability that the improvement random variable has the value 0? One, one half. What's the probability that both those variables have the value 0? Zero? 0. zero. Right? Because if you get a score of 0, you have to either get better or worse during the test. If you get a very good score or a very bad score, you can't improve at all. So that is equal to 0, which is certainly not equal to the probability that x equals 0 times the probability of y equals 0, because this is a half times a half or one fourth. If I can exhibit any pair of values x and y with the property that the probability that x achieves the first value and y achieves the second is different from the probability that those two values are achieved simultaneously, I have established that the two variables are not independent. I just have to show one counterexample. So this is uh, my storyline may be a little different from the usual, but this is the standard simple example of how two random variables can be uncorrelated yet fail to be independent. I've got five minutes left, but I'm not going to use it. Uh, it's perfect timing because we can do the second half on generating functions. 
and I'm going to try to get this board clean. Okay, so uh, now I want to explain just a little bit about generating functions and do my favorite simple example. We're just scratching the surface, the surface of this. Um, Well, uh, first, I washed my dirty blackboard in front of the class, though not in front of the camera. So those watching this on video will see how beautiful this is. And I guess since I cover this with uh, incomprehensible squiggles from time to time, I should quote one of my favorite bits of Lewis Carroll from The Hunting of the Stark, which goes, he had bought a large map representing the sea without the least vestige of land and the crew were much pleased when they found it to be a map they could all understand. So I think that's true of this blackboard too, and uh, I'll try to continue to turn it into a blackboard that you can all understand. Going on to number four, generating functions. So here's the definition, and you might ask, why would anyone want to make this definition? To which one answer is, that's not a valid mathematical question. I can define anything any way I want. But to which I will give the example, the answer. I will show you how to use this concept to answer questions that would otherwise have been very messy, basically relying on the fact that we built up lots of technology for the algebra of products and powers. So this is the generating function for random variable capital X. And it's a function of s. Don't ask me what s is. s doesn't mean anything. It has no interpretation. This is basically a coding trick where what we do is we take the sum over all the values of k, assumed non-negative, and for our cases even assumed to be non-negative integers over all the values k that the random variable capital X can achieve. So there is, wrong way around, the mass function for random variable x evaluated at k multiplied by s to the k. And basically, by taking these numbers and multiplying them each by some power of s, what I'm doing is taking a sequence of numbers that sum to 1 and turning it either into a polynomial or an infinite series. So what this operation does is it might turn 1, 2, 3 into 1 plus 2x plus 1 plus 2s Let's divide by 6 to make them sum to 1 anyway. 1 plus 2s plus 3s squared over 6, from which you could recover the original mass function. So this is adding nothing. It is just another way of encoding all these probabilities in a single function, for which I can frequently write down a simple formula. Just to remind you what this is, this is the sum of the probability that capital X has the value little k times s to the k. And if we want to be really concise about this, we can say that this is the definition of the expectation of s raised to the capital X power. Because what we do is take every power of x that can occur weight that power by the probability that that exponent occurs. So this is a very concise way of writing this, which I won't take much advantage of. A feature of this which is useful for checking. If I substitute 1 in, then I get the sum of the probability that x equals little k times s to the times 1 to the k, 
which is always 1, and that's equal 1. So this function has the property that uh, when you evaluate it for s equals 1, you have to get 1 back because the probability is summed to 1. And in fact, it's only the values of s close to 1 that make any difference. So you never have to worry about, oh dear, if I plug s equals minus 1 into this, this series expansion doesn't work. If something works when s is close to 1, that's good enough for purposes of generating. OK, so there's the definition. Now, why is this useful? The reason this is useful is that if you have two independent random variables, the generating function for their sum is the product of their generating functions. And in general, it's a pain to work out the mass function for the sum of random variables. For example, if you roll six dice, working out the mass function for the random variable, which is the sum of the totals, is a real mess. You've got to count up all the different ways you can get 6, 7, 8, 9, and so on on 6 dice. That's feasible for 2, but it's a pain for 6. So if I can show you a technique that lets you analyze one die and raise the resulting function to the sixth power, I have shown you something that will spare you a lot of computational labor. So let me now prove this. This is topic 5, which is product of generating functions. And I believe to cope with the 26 ca character limit, I left the rating out of here. <coughs> so let's write down the generating function for the random variable x plus y. Uh, and I think I started this out a little bit too quickly in the notes. What I wrote down as the first step is correct, but I'm going to start now from the definition. What is this? This is the sum over all pairs of values uh, well, no. We're really going back. K is a value that can be achieved by the sum of x and y. And what this, strictly speaking, means is this is the probability that the sum of x and y achieves the value k multiplied by s to the k, summed over all values of k. Everyone agree? That's my definition of generating function. I just plugged the random variable x plus y into there. Now, of course, this is a pain to calculate because there are, in general, many pairs x and y that have the same sum. For example, when you have two dice, x could have the value 1 while y has the value 6. x could be 2 while y is 5, and so on. So as a practical matter, when we do this, we end up evaluating this by doing another sum over the value i that's achieved by x. And since uh, these are independent random variables, I can write this as the probability that x equals i times the probability that y equals k minus i times s to the k. I'll make a note here. These are independent, so it factors. And while it wasn't in the title, maybe we should get into everyone's note. This is the product of generating function for, for independent random variables. If they're not independent, none of this works.
OK, now how do we do this? Well, let's assume that the random variables x and y take on only non-negative integer values. Strictly speaking, that's not necessary in order to do the proof, but it will be the case in every example that we'll consider. So there are two ways to get k equals 1. Either x could equal 1 while y is 0, or the other way around. There are three ways that k could equal 2. Four ways that k could equal 3, and so on. And strictly speaking, what this formula is telling us to do is to move out along this diagonal. And for each value of k, count up the ways, sum up the probabilities for all the ways of getting that particular value of k, and then take that sum of probabilities and multiply it by s to the k. But what are we doing? We end up summing over every pair of integers, don't we? So I can set j equal to k minus i. Now I can label that j so that you can see i plus j equals k. And the thing I'm computing is then the sum over all values of i and j of the probability that x equals i times the probability that y equals k minus i, but a simpler name for that is j, times s to the k, but we're not talking about k anymore. We want to replace it by i plus j. And now this factors, because s to the i plus j is s to the i times s to the j. So this is the sum over i times the probability that x equals i times s to the i multiplied by the sum over j of the probability that y equals j times s to the j. And this first factor is the generating function for x. And this second factor is the generating function for y. So I prove quite generally that if we have two uh, independent random variables, the generating function for their sum is the product of their generating functions. It will follow immediately by induction. I'm not going to bother to write out the proof that if I have n random variables, the uh, generating function for the sum of those n random variables is the product of their n generating functions. The proof is basically just regard that as two random variables one of which is the product of the first n minus 1, and the other of which is the nth one. So it follows as a corollary that if we have n copies of random variable x, we roll n dice or flip n coins then the generating function for the sum of those n copies is the generating function for x raised to the nth power. And this is the really useful result, because it allows us to deal with arbitrary numbers of coin flips, arbitrary numbers of dice, and so on. Yeah, Jerry? Uh, it looks to me like if, if you uh, take your definition of the generating function as an expectation, that you get all that for free. Isn't it the same yes, proof? Yes, that, that is true. Um, so you're saying that, um, yeah, Jerry's point is if I say that g of x plus y of s is the expectation of 
s to the x plus y. You know, I don't like that. The reason I don't like it <laughs> is if you say this is obviously Let's see. No, that's OK. So you say, this is the expectation of s to the x times s to the y. And if these random variables are independent, then the expectation of the product is the product of the expectations. Yeah, I, th I think that is a perfectly legitimate proof. Uh, which I don't like simply because it seems too good to be true. I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm very skeptical about these proofs that rely on generating functions as expectations of s to the something or other. But I think they're right. Now let me do, let me do a simple example to show you, one, that this works, and two, that in many cases uh, it doesn't buy you anything that uh, the labor in computing the product of the generating functions is exactly the same labor you would have done otherwise. So here is number six, a simple example. And then we'll go on to the exciting examples. So two random variables, x is equal to 0, is equal to 1 or two, each with a probability of a half. So what's the generating function for x? It's the probability that x equals 1, which is times s to the first power, which is more conventionally written as s, plus the probability that s has the value of 2 times s squared. So that's all you have to do to create one of these generating functions. Now to make one that's a little bit different, y can equal 1, 2, or 3, each with a probability of 1 third. So g sub y of s is 1 third times s plus s squared plus s cubed. And if you want to check that, you say, well, I look at the coefficient of s cubed. That's 1 third. Yes, that's the probability that y equals 3. Now let's compute the product. The generating function for the sum is the product of these generating functions. That's 1 half times 1 third. So 1 half times s plus s squared times 1 third times s plus s squared plus s cubed. And that's equal to 1 6 times a slightly messy algebra problem. But let me remind you how we do the algebra. s times s is s squared. And then we have to say we've got s times s squared and s squared times s. So 2 s cubed. And we've got s times s cubed and s squared times s squared. So we've got two s to the fourth terms and then s to the fifth. And so this tells us if we add together the two random variables, we have a random variable that can achieve the values 2, 3, 4, and 5 with probabilities 1, 6, 2, 6, 2, 6, then 1, 6, respectively. And we could simulate this by saying, we're going to flip a coin and roll a die. If the coin comes up tails, you get a dollar. If, you, if it comes up heads, you get two dollars. For a die roll of one or two, you get one buck. Three or four gets you two bucks. Five or six gets you three bucks. Uh, what's the mass function for your payoff if uh, you get both the coin flip and the die roll working for you? 
And the answer, of course, can be done by brute force. You have to combine every possible value of x with every possible value of y. And now you say, yes, in, indeed, there are two cases where I get a sum of 4. There are two cases where I get a sum of 3. And there's one case where I get a sum of 5. So doing this analysis and doing this polynomial multiplication longhand is exactly the same thing. Does everyone see that? So in cases where you can't use the binomial expansion or other well-known algebraic trick, this buys you very, very little. It's only when clever algebra tells you something that this will enable you to see something that you would probably have overlooked if you did the calculation without generating functions. But at least I've convinced you that it gives the right answer. OK, now I'm going to do a hard problem. This is mistitled in the notes. It said generating function for two dice, but it's really generating function for three dice. And I'm just flat out going to tell you now, there will be a problem like this on the homework, on, on the final exam. The generating function problem on the final exam will be very, very similar to this one. So if you're only going to learn one non-trivial thing about generating functions, the non-trivial thing to learn is how to do this sort of problem. Uh, because it's a wonderful illustration of the power of generating functions in a simple algebraic context. And this is a problem that uh, most PhDs don't know how to solve. Uh, it was news to me two years ago when I learned how to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate using generating functions the probability that we get a sum of 9 on the three dice. And then we'll go ahead and do some other values so that you can all get the technique down pat. So here goes. For one die, this is going to be our random variable x, the generating function. But I'm going to write it as g sub 1 because we've got three copies of the same random variable. Naming them x, y, and z doesn't accomplish very much. And so I will use a subscript that indicates how many dice have been added together. g1 of s is equal to what? OK, what's the probability for any of the individual numbers? 1 sixth. And then since any value of, f, of x between 1 and 6 inclusive has the same probability of 1 6. I have to add up all the powers of s from 1 to 6. So far, so good? Now, I said this rarely pays off except when you can do clever algebra. I'll factor out an s. And now, we know a general formula for this sum, this is 1 minus s to the sixth over 1 minus s, isn't it? Uh, you would have to be insane to use this when the largest exponent was only 2 or 3. This would really be the only hope if the largest exponent was some arbitrary n. But it turns out when the largest exponent is a 6, this really pays off. OK, now for three dice. We've got three dice rolled independently.
And my random variable is now the total that shows up on those three dice. The sum of three random variables like this. When I add together random variables that are independent, what do I do with their generating functions? I multiply them. So all I have to do is take this generating function for one die and cube it. So this is s cubed over 216 times 1 minus s sixth cubed over 1 minus s cubed. And notice now, while there is no simple general formula for the mass function when you roll n dice, there is a simple formula for the generating function. And if someone asks for the mass function, what you do is to be a bit of a smart aleck and say, look, here's the generating function. If you want to know the probability the total is 13, just pull out the uh, coefficient of s to the 13th in this function. Uh, I'm not going to take the trouble to do it for you. But I've not only answered your question, I've answered all the other questions at the same time. So now the question is, how are we going to tease the coefficient of s to the ninth out of this? And the answer is, we're going to do something really strange. This is a finite sum, right? What we're going to do is take this finite sum and expand it in an infinite series. Now, it's going to look like an infinite series. If we actually computed the thousandth term, we'd discover the coefficient was 0. So there are only a finite number of non-zero terms in this series, but it's not obvious from the form of the series. So let's do this. G3 of s is equal to s cubed over 216 times 1 minus s to the sixth cubed. Newton knew how to do that. Well, Newton not only knew how to do this, he was able to prove it. And then there's 1 minus s raised to the minus 3 power. Uh, not clear whether Newton proved that. He may actually have done the proof for negative exponents and just missed the arbitrary case. But this is the negative binomial expansion, right? This is 1 plus 3 choose 2 s plus 4 choose 2 s squared plus 5 choose 2 s cubed plus dot, dot, dot. And then I want to write down some terms that will be useful for us. Um, the one I absolutely have to have is 8, but I'll put the one before it and after it. 7 choose 2 s to the fifth plus 8 choose 2 s to the sixth plus 9 choose 2 s to the seventh plus dot, dot, dot. So far, so good? Now, the probability of rolling 9 with 3 dice is the coefficient of s to the ninth in this function. And that's not hard to find. Because there aren't that many terms that have an s to the ninth. I can take this s cubed and this 1, and then what power of x, s do I have to combine with those two? s to the sixth. So that's 8 choose 2. And there's only one other way of making s to the ninth out of this. What is it, Jerry? You... Well, the minus three to s yeah, the six. minus 3 with this and the 1 there. So that's 1 over 216 multiplied by 8 times 7 over 2 minus 3, or 25 2 16 That sure beats counting, doesn't it? And the reason that we saved labor in this case is because we use the general case of the binomial theorem for negative exponents, which uh, is a powerful algebraic result that tells us something that's not obvious from elementary algebra. OK, let's try some others. 
first let me point out, when you sum three dice, the total comes out between 3 and 18. So the expected roll is 21 over 2, or 10 and a half. And therefore, we would expect to get the same probability for 10 and for 11. We'd expect the probabilities to go up until we get to 10, stay the same at 11, and then go down. And that will give us a check that we're doing things right. So this should give us something a little bit smaller. This one is really easy. What's the coefficient of uh, x to the 8th? The only, fact, the only term I can use here is this 1. So that has to be combined with s to the 5th, whose coefficient is 7 choose 2. So the answer is 21 2 sixteenths. Try doing that by hand. You can do it by, let's do this one by hand. You can say on the first die, we can have any of the values 1 through 6. Then on the other die, the sum has to be whatever makes the total be 8. And the number of ways of getting 7 is 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and you add those up, 11, 15, 18, 21. So that is the right answer. But even taking advantage of our knowledge of how many ways there are rolling a given total on two dice, uh, this way is considerably more laborious than the one I just did. Let's go for 10. One over two sixteen. Okay, who can see one collection of terms where the exponent is ten? <coughs> We've got the three, the one, and the seven, and that has a coefficient of nine choose two. And there's one other way of doing this. We've got the 3, the 6, and the 1. That's right. So we've got uh, minus 3 and plus 3. So that's 1 over 216 uh, times 36 minus 9, which is 27 over 216. And as a final check, we'll make sure we get the same answer for 11 that we got for 10. OK? Uh, for a sum equals 11, what's one way of getting a total of 11? This, this, and it's not written, but 10 choose 2 times s to the 8. And the other way of getting 11 as the sum of the powers is this, this, and this, so that's minus 3 and plus 6, minus 18. 10 choose 2 is 45. And by the way, if you were doing the computation by brute force, the 10 case and the 11 case would look very much the same. You'd end up adding the same numbers. Whereas here, you're combining rather different numbers. Uh, there's, there's something kind of magical going on here, but it gives the right answer. Uh, and of course, if you were to ask some silly question like, what's the probability that the sum equals 20? When you calculate the coefficient of s to the 20th, it has to come out to be 0. But you're going to end up adding a whole bunch of terms together to get that 0. So it's definitely not a labor-saving device for very large values of the exponent. Okay, everyone happy with this? Okay, now the next one, um, I cannot remember where I saw this. Uh, somewhere I saw that there was a clever way of creating two loaded dice with the property that if you rolled both those dice, 
you got exactly the same probability distribution for their sum as with two honest dice. And I couldn't remember how to do it. And finally, I got to teaching about generating functions. I thought, hmm, this must have been something where the proof involved generating functions. And I managed to reconstruct it. So I don't know where I learned this from, but I believe I have re reconstructed what I learned from whatever source. So this is a truly remarkable result. You have access to a good machine shop. And with the aid of that machine shop, you can take, for example, a cube and flatten it down so that the die is more likely to come up with the uh, closely spaced flat faces up than to come up on its side. And having done that, you could even turn it on its side and grind so you could get different probabilities for the three pairs of faces. But we're assuming that a skilled machinist can load a die any way you want. That for each pair of faces, you can set the probability individually. Because clearly, if you flatten the die down to a small, thin square, the probability that those faces will come up is very close to 1. Whereas if it's a cube, you get 1 third. And if you make the die into a uh, the technical term, I guess it's a prism, well, a, a rectangular column, the probability that it will land on end is very small. So since you can get the probability to go to 0 or go to 1, and it's 1 third for a cubicle die, we'll assume you can get anything in between. Now, here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to write down the generating function. This is number 8, clever loaded dice. Does that show up OK against the red? Should I try green? OK, we'll go back to Christmas decor. So for two dice, yeah, this is better. G2 of s. This is the generating function for two dice. It's the square of the generating function for one die. So that's s squared over 36. And now what I'm going to do is write the one die function as 1 plus s cubed times 1 plus s plus s squared. And I'll write underneath this what happens when I multiply it out. I get 1 plus s plus s squared plus, now the s cubed kicks in, s fourth plus s, sorry, plus s cubed plus s to the fourth plus s to the fifth. So these two factors give me the right function for one die, and then I square it. Now, here's the clever idea. There's actually an even better version of this on the homework. Uh, I dreamed this up and used it as a final exam problem once. I shouldn't have. You know, one of the rules for writing final exams, for those of you who teach, is whenever in the process of writing a final exam, you think, that's a really clever problem. They've never seen anything like that before. They'll be amazed and pleased. No. People are not amazed and pleased to see clever problems for the first time. What you should do is you take that question, you put it in your file, and use it on the homework next year, and write something more straightforward for the final exam. Anyway, I dreamed this one up for the final exam in my undergraduate course. I'm giving it to you on the homework. And it's, it's a, uh, an even clever version cleverer version of this where you manage, as I recall, to replace two octahedral dice with three tetrahedral dice while still getting the same probability distribution. But the same trick works. The trick is, instead of factoring the generating function into this times itself, I'm going to factor it differently. I'm going to write this as s over 4 times 1 plus s cubed squared 
times s over 9 times 1 plus s plus s squared. That's the same function, right? There's my s squared over 36. I've got two powers of that and two powers of that. But what I'm now going to do is to say, I've written this generating function as a product of two functions in a different way. And I'm going to associate each of those generating functions with a random variable and go to my friendly machinist and ask him to produce a loaded die that produces this generating function. So what does this do? We have g sub x of s is equal to 1 fourth times s plus 2 s to the fourth plus s to the seventh. So that means we need a die that has one chance in four of coming up one, two chances in four of coming up four, and one chance in four of coming up seven. And that's perfectly easy to do. We flatten the die a bit. And what number do we put on the top and bottom faces? 4. And then on the two side faces, we put 7s. And on the front and back, we put a 1. Uh, so 1 on the front and back, 7 on the two sides, and 4 on the top and bottom. And we mill the die down so that the 4, 4 face has a probability 1 half of coming up. But we keep the whole thing with a square cross section so that the 1, 1, and 7, 7 faces have equal probability. So there is a chance device that will give you a 4 half the time, 1, 1 fourth of the time, and 7, 1 fourth of the time. It has this generating function. The other one is a little bit trickier. Let's first multiply it out. We have 1 9 times 1 plus 2s plus 3s squared plus 2s to the fourth plus s to the fifth. 1 plus 2. Yeah, those sum to 9. So this has to be a die. Oh, I didn't. That's right. I've moved the s in. s plus 2s squared plus 3s cubed plus 2s to the fourth plus s to the fifth. So I've taken this and multiplied it all out. And this has to be a die for which the probability of a 1 or the probability of a 5 is equal to what? 1 ninth. And the probability of a 2 and the probability of a 4 both have to equal 2 ninths. And the probability of a 3 has to be 3 ninths. So I go to the machinist and say, uh, the craps players in the back room just love that thing you made for me last week. And I made $5,000 off them to boot. This week, I need something that has relative probabilities of 2, 3, and 4 for the three faces. And the machine says, no problem, Doc. I'll have it for you in an hour. And once I get this, what numbers go on the face that's most likely to come up? No, not three. Two and four. So the face that comes up four times out of nine, I put the two on one side and the four on the other. The one with the intermediate probability, I put a three on both sides. And then the one that's least likely to come out uppermost, I put the one on one side 
and the 5 on the other. And I have achieved a die that gives this generating function. And when I roll the two dice together and add them up, I get the product of these two generating functions. And therefore, this has the same probability as uh, with two unloaded dice. I didn't believe this after I'd worked it out. So I worked a couple of examples. Let's try just one. Let's calculate. the probability that the sum is equal to 7, which we know should equal 1 sixth. OK, how can we get a 7 out of these two dice? Well, uh, we can't use a 7 on the first one because we can never get a 0 on the second one. But we can have a 4 on the first combined with a 3 on the second. Or we could have a 1 on the first combined with a 6 on the second. And this is a probability of 1 half multiplied by 1 third. Whoops, wait a minute. Pardon? Oh, there's no 6's. So this is too easy. So the only way of getting a 7 is a 4 on this die, a 3 on this, which has a probability of 1 6. Uh, let's try sum equals 9. The probability should be 1 ninth for that. How can we get a 9? We can combine a 7 and a 2. That's 1 fourth for the 7 times uh, 2 ninths for the 2. Or we could get a 4 combined with a 5. That's 1 half times 1 ninth, which is 1 18th. And when we add them together, we get 1 ninth. The generating function proves it, but I just checked a few cases by hand. So uh, this is absolutely amazing that there is one and only one possible pair of loaded dice that will replicate the exact same result for the totals that we get with ordinary dice. Now, to finish up, how long have I got? 10 minutes, maybe? 10 minutes. Uh, I just want to show you what the generating functions look like for, I won't call them your favorite distributions, because it includes the Poisson distribution, which is I assume after grading quizzes, everyone's least favorite distribution. But it does have a simple generating function. So here goes. Well-known distributions. So the first one, yes? Or the eraser, a different color. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> well, That's better. we'll try with green. It shows up nicely against the red. OK, so a single Bernoulli variable, one that's uh, 1 with probability p and 0 with probability q. has the generating function q times s to the 0 plus p times s to the 1, which is more neatly written as q plus p s. If you take a whole bunch of random variables which have 1 with probability p and 0 with probability two, q, and add them together, what distribution do you get? Binomial. The binomial distribution. So for the binomial distribution, I'll call it g sub n of s, the generating function is q plus p s raised to the nth power. And sure enough, 
if you multiply that out by the binomial theorem to get the various powers of s, uh, it will give you the mass function for the binomial distribution. OK, uh, let's try geometric. For the geometric distribution, and this will be the before rather than the until version, that is, you don't count the dog bite that sends the dog to the pound. OK, convention is probability P that Fido bites or that you roll a 6, probability Q that Fido doesn't bite the postman or that you roll something other than a 6. What's the probability that Fido has no bite-free days before he bites the postman for the first time? It's just P, right? So this is going to be P times S to the 0 plus P times Q times S to the 1 plus P times Q squared times S squared plus dot dot. And I've warned you in the outline that Sturzacher uses the until version. So he has an extra factor of s in all of these things, reflecting the fact that he's counting the role where you get your first six, or the bite, or the dog postman encounter where Fido bites the postman. I think it's a little bit simpler this case. In this case, so I have p times one plus q s plus q squared s squared plus dot 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 which is, of course, p over 1 minus qs. That's simple, isn't it? And of course, you expand that. You get the mass function for the geometric distribution. Continuing to do all of probability theory in five minutes, <laughs> negative binomial. A negative binomial random variable is the sum of n independent geometric random variables, right? If you want to roll until you get three sixes, you roll till you get the first six, then till the second six, then till the third six. And uh, that's the negative, a negative binomial distribution. So the answer is the generating function for that, g sub n of s is equal to p over 1 minus qs to the nth power, and of course, expand that using the negative binomial expansion, you get the mass function out of it. But see how nice these generating functions are for encapsulating uh, all the probabilities associated with one of these random variables. Uh, it's really much more effective in some ways than a formula for the mass function, because uh, you get this nice simple formula that if you could read it over the green that underlies it, uh, tells you the whole thing. One last one, Poisson. And this one's the easiest of all. What do we have? We have e to the minus lambda, lambda over k, sorry, lambda to the k, over k factorial is equal to our mass function. We have to multiply by s to the k and sum up. That's e to the minus lambda. And what's this thing? Uh, e to the lambda uh, to the uh, e to the plus lambda s. So I can write this, if you like, as e to the lambda times s minus 1. Now, problem. Prove in 30 seconds or less that the sum of two Poisson random variables has a Poisson distribution. Answer. Multiply the generating functions for the two Poisson random variables. You get e to the lambda 1 times s minus 1 times e to the lambda 2 times s minus 1, which is e to the lambda 1 plus lambda 2 times s minus 1. And without any fussing about sums that give exponential functions, you would prove that if you have two independent 
Poisson random variables. Their sum is a random variable with the Poisson distribution. And the parameter is the sum of the parameters for the original two. So this is just scratching the surface of what one can do with generating functions. I should say, uh, I'm an old hand at this. Um, in my PhD thesis on uh, applications of the non-compact group SL6C to elementary particle physics, I ended up having to find a generating function for generalized hypergeometric functions. And uh, I actually wrote to the woman who had written the definitive book on generalized hypergeometric functions. She said she'd never seen it anywhere before. So I am the inventor of one of the world's generating functions. It was considerably messier than these. OK, uh, so we will reconvene on the 3rd of January. And I will uh, prove, state and prove the strong and weak laws of uh, large numbers. And I think I'll actually have time to explain to you the subtle distinction between the strong law and the weak law, which is a fascinating distinction, but one that it takes about 20 minutes to assimilate at best.